With movements of mechanical care and an air of abstraction, old General Santiara lighted a long and thick cigar. It was a good many hours before we could send a party back to the ravine, he said to his guests. We had found one-third of the town laid low, the rest shaken up, and the inhabitants, rich and poor, reduced to the same state of distraction by the universal disaster. The affected cheerfulness of some contrasted with the despair of others. In the general confusion, a number of reckless thieves, without fear of God or man, became a danger to those who, from the downfall of their homes, had managed to save some valuables, crying misericordia louder than any at every tremor and beating their breasts with one hand, these scoundrels robbed the poor victims with the other, not even stopping short of murder. General Rober's division was occupied entirely in guarding the destroyed quarters of the town from the depredations of these human monsters. Taken up with my duties of orderly officer, it was only in the morning that I could assure myself of the safety of my own family. My mother and my sisters had escaped with their lives from that ballroom where I had left them early in the evening. I remember those two beautiful young women, God rest their souls, as if I saw them this moment, in the garden of our destroyed house, pale but active, assisting some of our poor neighbors, in their soiled ball dresses, and with the dust of fallen walls on their hair. As to my mother, she had a stoical soul in her frail body. Half covered by a costly shawl, she was lying on a rustic seat by the side of an ornamental basin, whose fountain had ceased to play forever on that night. I had hardly had time to embrace them all with transports of joy when my chief, coming along, dispatched me to the ravine with a few soldiers to bring in my strong man, as he called him, and that pale girl. But there was no one for us to bring in. A landslide had covered the ruins of the house, and it was like a large mound of earth with only the ends of some timbers visible here and there, nothing more. Thus were the tribulations of the old royalist couple ended. An enormous and unconsecrated grave had swallowed them up alive in their unhappy obstinacy against the will of a people to be free and their daughter was gone. That Gaspar Ruiz had carried her off I understood very well, but as the case was not foreseen, I had no instructions to pursue him, and certainly I had no desire to do so. I had grown mistrustful of my interference. It had never been successful, and had not even appeared credible. He was gone. Well, let him go, and he had carried off the royalist girl, nothing better, vaya con Dios. This was not the time to bother about a deserter who, justly or unjustly, ought to have been dead, and a girl from whom it would have been better to have never been born. So I marched my men back to the town. After a few days, order having been re-established, all the principal families, including my own, left for Santiago. We had a fine house there. At the same time, the division of Robles was moved to new cantonments near the capital. This change suited very well the state of my domestic and amorous feelings. One night, rather late, I was called to my chief. I found General Robles in his quarters, at ease, with his uniform off, drinking neat brandy out of a tumbler, as a precaution, he used to say, against the sleeplessness induced by the bites of mosquitoes. He was a good soldier, and he taught me the art and practice of war. No doubt God had been merciful to his soul, for his motives were never other than patriotic, if his character was irascible. As to the use of mosquito nets, he considered it effeminate, shameful, unworthy of a soldier. I noticed 
At the first glance that his face, already very red, wore an expression of high good humor. Aha, Senor Teniente, he cried loudly, as I saluted at the door. Behold, your strong man has turned up again. He extended to me a folded letter, which I saw was superscribed to the commander-in-chief of the Republican armies. This, General Robles, went on in his loud voice, was thrust by a boy into the hand of a sentry at the Quartel General. While the fellow stood there thinking of his girl, no doubt, for before he could gather his wits together, the boy had disappeared amongst the market people, and he protested he could not recognize him to save his life. My chief told me further that the soldier had given the letter to the sergeant of the guard, and that ultimately it had reached the hands of our generalissimo. His Excellency had dined to take cognizance of it with his own eyes. After that, he had referred the matter in confidence to General Robles. The letter, senors, I cannot now recollect textually. I saw the signature of Gaspar Ruiz. He was an audacious fellow. He had snatched a soul for himself out of a cataclysm, remember, and now it was that soul which had dictated the terms of his letter. Its tone was very independent. I remember it struck me at the time as noble, dignified. It was, no doubt, her letter. Now I shudder at the depth of its duplicity. Gaspar Ruiz made to complain of the injustice of which he had been a victim. He invoked his previous record of fidelity and courage, having been saved from death by the miraculous interposition of Providence. He could think of nothing but of retrieving his character. This, he wrote, he could not hope to do in the ranks as a discredited soldier still under suspicion. He had the means to give a striking proof of his fidelity and he ended by proposing to the general-in-chief a meeting at midnight in the middle of the plaza before the maneta. The signal would be to strike fire with flint and steel three times, which was not too conspicuous and yet distinctive enough for recognition. San Martin, the great liberator, loved men of audacity and courage. Besides, he was just and compassionate. I told him as much of the man's story as I knew, and was ordered to accompany him on the appointed night. The signals were duly exchanged. It was midnight, and the whole town was dark and silent. Their two cloaked figures came together in the center of the vast plaza, and, keeping discreetly at a distance, I listened for an hour or more to the murmur of their voices. Then the general motioned me to approach. And as I did, I heard San Martin, who was courteous to gentle and simple alike, offer Gaspar Ruiz the hospitality of the headquarters for the night. But the soldier refused, saying that he would not be worthy of that honor till he had done something. You cannot have a common deserter for your guest, Excellency, he protested with a low laugh, and stepping backwards, merged slowly into the night. The commander-in-chief observed to me, as we turned away, he had somebody with him, our friend Ruiz. I saw two figures for a moment. It was an unobtrusive companion. I, too, had observed another figure join the vanishing form of Gaspar Ruiz. It had the appearance of a short fellow in a poncho and a big hat, and I wondered stupidly who it could be he had dared take into his confidence. I might have guessed it could be no one but that fatal girl, alas. Where he kept her concealed I do not know. He had, it was known afterwards, an uncle, his mother's brother, a small shopkeeper in Santiago. Perhaps it was there that she found a roof and food. Whatever she found, it was poor enough to exasperate her pride and keep up her anger and hate. It is certain she did not accompany him on the feet he undertook to accomplish first of all. It was nothing less than the destruction of a store of war material collected secretly by the Spanish authorities in the south, a town called Linares. 
Gaspar Ruiz was entrusted with a small party only, but they proved themselves worthy of San Martin's confidence. The season was not propitious. They had to swim swollen rivers. They seemed, however, to have galloped night and day, outriding the news of their foray and holding straight for the town, a hundred miles into the enemy's territory. Till a break of day they rode into it, sword in hand, surprising the little garrison. It fled without making a stand, leaving most of its officers in Gaspar Ruiz's hands. A great explosion of gunpowder ended the conflagration of the magazines. The raiders had set on fire without loss of time. In less than six hours they were riding away at the same mad speed, without the loss of a single man. Good as they were, such an exploit is not performed without a still better leader. I was dining at the headquarters when Gaspar Ruiz himself brought the news of his success, and it was a great blow to the royalist troops. For a proof, he displayed to us the garrison's flag. He took it from under his poncho and flung it on the table. The man was transfigured. There was something exulting and menacing in the expression of his face. He stood behind General San Martin's chair and looked proudly at us all. He had a round blue cap edged with silver braid on his head, and we could all see a large white scar on the nape of his sunburnt neck. Somebody asked him what he had done with the captured Spanish officers. He shrugged his shoulders scornfully. What a question to ask. In a partisan war, you do not burden yourself with prisoners. I'll let them go. And here are their sword knots. He flung a bunch of them on the table upon the flag. Then General Robles, whom I was attending there, spoke up in his loud, thick voice. You did? Then, my brave friend, you do not know yet how a war like ours ought to be conducted. You should have done this. And he passed the edge of his hand across his own throat. Alas, senors, it was only too true that on both sides this contest in its nature so heroic was stained by ferocity. The murmurs that arose at General Robles' words were by no means unanimous in tone. But the generous and brave San Martin praised the humane action, and pointed out to Ruiz a place on his right hand. Then raising a full glass he proposed a toast. Caballeros and comrades in arms, let us drink the health of Captain Gaspar Ruiz. And when we had emptied our glasses, I intend, the commander-in-chief continued, to entrust him with the guardianship of our southern frontier, while we go afar to liberate our brethren in Peru. He whom the enemy could not stop from striking a blow at his very heart will know how to protect the peaceful populations we leave behind us to pursue our sacred task, and he embraced the silent Gaspar Ruiz by his side. Later on, when we all rose from table, I approached the latest officer of the army with my congratulations. And Captain Ruiz, I added, perhaps you do not mind telling a man who has always believed in the uprightness of your character what became of Donna Herminia on that night. At this friendly question, his aspect changed. He looked at me from under his eyebrows with the heavy, dull glance of a guasso, of a peasant. Senor Teniente, he said thickly, as if very much cast down, do not ask me about the senorita, for I prefer not to think about her at all when I am amongst you. He looked, with a frown, all about the room, full of smoking and talking officers, of course I did not insist. These senors were the last words I was to hear him utter for a long, long time. The very next day we embarked for our arduous expedition to Peru, and we only heard of Gaspar Ruiz's doings in the midst of battles of our own. He had been appointed military guardian of our southern province. He raised a partida but his leniency to the conquered foe displeased the civil governor, who was a formal, uneasy man, full of suspicions. 
He forwarded reports against Gaspar Ruiz to the Supreme Government, one of them being that he had married publicly with great pomp a woman of royalist tendencies. Quarrels were sure to arise between these two men of very different character. At last the civil governor began to complain of his inactivity and to hint at treachery, which he wrote would not be surprising in a man of such antecedents. Gaspar Ruiz heard of it. His rage flamed up, and the woman ever by his side knew how to feed it with perfidious words. I do not know whether really the supreme government ever did, as he complained afterwards, send orders for his arrest. It seems certain that the civil governor began to tamper with his officers, and that Gaspar Ruiz discovered the fact. One evening, when the governor was giving a tertilia, Gaspar Ruiz, followed by six men he could trust, appeared riding through the town to the door of the government house, and entered the sala, armed, his hat on his head. As the governor, displeased, advanced to meet him, he seized the wretched man round the body, carried him off from the midst of the appalled guest as though he were a child, and flung him down the outer steps into the street. An angry hug from Gaspar Ruiz was enough to crush the life out of a giant. But in addition, Gaspar Ruiz's horsemen fired their pistols at the body of the governor as it lay motionless at the bottom of the stairs. After this, as he called it, act of justice, Ruiz crossed the Rio Blanco, followed by the greater part of his band, and entrenched himself upon a hill. A company of regular troops sent out foolishly against him was surrounded and destroyed almost to a man. Other expeditions, though better organized, were equally unsuccessful. It was during these sanguinary skirmishes that his wife first began to appear on horseback at his right hand. Rendered proud and self-confident by his successes, Ruiz no longer charged at the head of his partida, but presumptuously, like a general directing the movements of an army, he remained in the rear, well-mounted and motionless on an eminence, sending out his orders. She was seen repeatedly at his side, and for a long time was mistaken for a man. There was much talk, then, of a mysterious white-faced chief to whom the defeats of our troops were ascribed. She rode like an Indian woman astride, wearing a broad-rimmed man's hat and a dark poncho. Afterwards, in the day of their greatest prosperity, this poncho was embroidered in gold, and she wore, then, also the sword of poor Don Antonio de Leva, this veteran Chilean officer, having the misfortune to be surrounded with his small force and running short of ammunition, found his death at the hands of the Araco Indians, the allies and auxiliaries of Gaspar Ruiz. This was the fatal affair long remembered afterwards as the massacre of the island. The sword of the unhappy officer was presented to her by Penelio, the Araquanian chief. For these Indians, struck by her aspect, the deathly pallor of her face, which no exposure to the weather seemed to affect, and her calm indifference under fire, looked upon her as a supernatural being, at least as a witch. By this superstition, the prestige and authority of Gaspar Ruiz amongst these ignorant people were greatly augmented. She must have savored her vengeance to the full on that day when she buckled on the sword of Don Antonio de Leva. It never left her side, unless she put on her woman's clothes. Not that she would, or could, ever use it, but she loved to feel it beating upon her thigh as a perpetual reminder and symbol of the dishonor to the arms of the Republic. She was insatiable. Moreover, on the path she had led Gaspar Ruiz upon, there is no stopping. Escaped prisoners, and they were not many, used to relate how, with a few whispered words, she could change the expression of his face and revive his flagging animosity. They told 
how after every skirmish, after every raid, after every successful action, he would ride up to her and look into her face. Its haughty calm was never relaxed. Her embrace and yours what must have been as cold as the embrace of a statue. He tried to melt her icy heart in a stream of warm blood. Some English naval officers who visited him at that time noticed the strange character of his infatuation. At the moment of surprise and curiosity in his audience, General Santierra paused for a moment. Yes, English naval officers, he repeated. Ruiz had consented to receive them to arrange for the liberation of some prisoners of your nationality and the territory upon which he ranged from sea coast to the Cordillera. There was a bay where the ships of that time, after rounding Cape Horn, used to resort for wood and water. There decoying the crew on shore, he captured first the whaling brig Hersalia and afterwards made himself master by surprise of two more ships, one English and one American. It was rumored at the time that he dreamed of setting up a navy of his own, but that of course was impossible. Still manning the brig with part of her own crew, and putting an officer and a good many men of his own on board, he sent her off to the Spanish governor of the island of kilo of his exploits and a demand for assistance in the war against the rebels. The governor could not do much for him, but he sent in return two light field pieces, a letter of compliments with a colonel's commission on the royal forces, and a great Spanish flag. The standard, with much ceremony, was hoisted over his house in the heart of the Araco country. Surely on that day she must have smiled on her guasso husband with a less haughty reserve. The senior officer of the English squadron on our coast made representations to our government as to these captures. But Gaspar Ruiz refused to treat with us. Then an English frigate proceeded to the bay, and her captain, doctor, and two lieutenants traveled inland under a safe conduct. They were well received and spent three days as guests of a partisan chief. A sort of military, barbaric state was kept up at the residence. It was furnished with the loot of frontier towns. When first admitted to the principal Salia, they saw his wife lying down. She was not in good health then. With Gaspar sitting at the foot of the couch, his hat was lying on the floor and his hands reposed on the hilt of his sword. During that first conversation he never removed his big hand from the sword hilt, except once to arrange the coverings about her with gentle, careful touches. They noticed that whenever she spoke he would fix his eyes upon her in a kind of expectant, breathless attention, and seemingly forget the existence of the world, and his own existence too. In the course of the farewell banquet at which she was present, reclining on her couch, he burst forth in complaints of the treatment he had received. After General San Martin's departure, he had been beset by spies, slandered by civil officials, his servants ignored, his liberty and even his life threatened by the Chilean government. He got up from the table, thundered execrations pacing the room wildly, then sat down on the couch at his wife's feet, his breast heaving, his eyes fixed on the floor. She reclined on her back, her head on the cushions, her eyes nearly closed. And now I am an honored Spanish officer, he added in a calm voice. The captain of the English frigate then took the opportunity to inform him gently that Lima had fallen and that by the terms of a convention the Spaniards were withdrawing from the whole continent. Gaspar Ruiz raised his head without hesitation, speaking with suppressed vehemence, declared that if not a single Spanish soldier were left in the whole of South America, he would persist in carrying on the contest against Chile to the last drop of blood, when he finished that mad tirade, his wife's long white hand was raised, and she just caressed his knee with the tips of her fingers for a fraction of a second. 
For the rest of the officer's stay, which did not extend for more than half an hour after the banquet, that ferocious chieftain of a desperate partida overflowed with amiability and kindness. He had been hospitable before, but now it seemed as though he could not do enough for the comfort and safety of his visitors' journey back to their ship. Nothing, I have been told, could have presented a greater contrast to his late violence or the habitual taciturn reserve in his manner, like a man elated beyond measure by an unexpected happiness. He overflowed with good will, amiability, and attentions. He embraced the officers like brothers, almost with tears in his eyes. The released prisoners were presented each with a piece of gold. At the last moment, suddenly, he declared he could do no less than restore to the masters of the merchant vessels all their private property. This unexpected generosity caused some delay in the departure of the party, and their first march was very short. Late in the evening, Gaspar Ruiz rode up with an escort to their campfires, bringing along with him a mule loaded with cases of wine. He had come, he said, to drink a stirrup cup with his English friends, whom he would never see again. He was mellow and joyous in his temper. He told stories of his own exploits, laughed like a boy, borrowed a guitar from the Englishman's chief muleteer, and sitting cross-legged on his superfine poncho spread before the glow of the embers, sang a guasso love song in a tender voice. Then his head dropped on his breast, his hands fell to the ground, the guitar rolled off his knees, and a great hush fell over the camp after the love song of the implacable partisan who had made so many of our people weep for destroyed homes and for loves cut short. Before anybody could make a sound, he sprang from the ground and called for his horse. Adios, my friends, he cried. Go with God. I love you. And tell them, well, in Santiago, that between Gaspar Ruiz, colonel of the King of Spain, and the Republican Carrion Crows of Chile, there is war to the last breath. War, war, war. With a great yell of war, 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 which his escort took up, they rode away, and the sound of the hooves and of voices died out in the distance between the slopes of the hills.